Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. Becky Teps Pornchai. And uh, guys, it's good to have you all back. We are continuing um, our series on the qualifications of an elder. And so let's just kind of jump right in. Um, If you haven't uh, been following us up to this point, I would really encourage you to go back and listen from the beginning, whether you are looking at becoming an elder or not, whether you're already an elder or not, certainly it would be good for, for those group of people. But the, this is in the Bible, and it's in the Bible so that the whole church has an understanding of what the church is meant to look like, what its leaders are meant to look like, what the qualifications are. Um, I think this is an area where really the church, at least in the West, could uh, it, it's severely lacking in knowledge. You can just look at search committees and things like that, and the majority of them are filled with well-meaning um God-loving people that have no idea what to look for in, in an elder or pastor uh, because yeah. they don't know these these passages. So um, today we're in te- we're on temperate. So uh, let me just read uh, our verse that we're in. Of course, we're in First Timothy chapter three, verse two says, "An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach." And it goes on. Uh, we did the husband of one wife or literally a one uh, woman man last week. Yeah. So temperate today. All right. Well, Eki, this seems like it should be a 10 minute conversation. Um, it won't <laughs> be because we're both pastors. So um, <laughs> if we were Martin Lloyd Jones, we could pull off like probably a six sermon series on oh, this word. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, but that's I, right. I can't do that. So tell us what, what, what is temperate? What does it mean here? Yeah, in the Greek, there's a, a couple of different definitions that show up. One is being very moderate in the drinking of an alcoholic beverage. Um, I don't believe that's what's in mind here since the start of verse 3 talks about uh, not being addicted to wine, which we'll get to that when we get there. Um, the second definition I think pertains here, and that's uh, being restrained in your conduct, uh, being self-controlled, uh, level-headed, uh, someone who's not uh, known by outbursts of anger, by belligerence, uh, things of that nature. So it's someone who knows how to control basically his own temper. Yeah. And I think, um, you, you you know, you made a good point when we're looking at these passages. Um, I, I know at least in my church, we're doing some classes on hermeneutics right now. And uh, and you'll you'll know this very well. It will ring and you'll probably have dreams about what I'm about to say. Context, context, context. Yeah, um, exactly. Context is king. Uh, and just as you've said in verse three, he addresses the issue of alcoholic beverages. And so that it wouldn't make sense that he's dealing with that here. Um, but yeah, literally, it means wineless. Um, metaphorically, which I think is how we're taking this, is what we should be doing is clear headed, just as you've said. But I want to flesh this out a little bit because, uh, you know, when you think, okay, he's moderate in his temper. Um, you know, he's self-controlled. All right, no big deal. Um, let's just move on. Um, but, but I think there's more to it than that. When you look at the word, um, it, it's, it's not just moderate in, in your temperament, but it's self-controlled, clear-headed, vigilant. I mean, there's more that embodies this word than just, he doesn't fly off the handle in, you know, if, if he doesn't get his way or if someone says something he doesn't like, um, and I thought maybe a good way to kind of describe this would be just to kind of think of the illustration Scripture gives in uh, that we have in Scripture of the shepherd and the flock, right? Um, if we kind of just dialogue through what a temperate man would kind of look like in terms of the sheep. Um, so it, it, you have the image of a shepherd, and w- we would say we're under shepherds, we're shepherds under the great shepherd. Yeah. We're entrusted um, a, a flock which belongs to God. And if you think about a temperate man, I, some of the things that I was thinking about this morning um, are just asking the question, okay, what does a real shepherd think about um, towards his flock? 
right? Well, you, you're always considering how to best feed your sheep. I mean, you're mm -hmm. thoughtful. And I think clear headed yeah. um, and reasonable gives the sense of a man who is, is diligent and, and always thinking. So he's yeah. thinking about how to best feed the sheep and it's constant. He's constantly considering the dangers and threats to his sheep. Um, he's continually thinking of the health of his sheep. Um, he's always concerned with the master's return and the state of the sheep that he's caring for when he returns. And so when you kind of think of it that way, I, I think it gives a deeper um, and, and greater sense to what a temperate man looks like. And so you're looking for not just a man who's mild mannered, um, but a man who has kind of a character of being extremely thoughtful. Uh, yeah. I, I would consider this a kind of planning type of of man, right? He's always looking for what's best, what needs to be improved, where are where do his people need to grow, where where do they need to be reproved, rebuked, and exhorted, right? As uh, Paul tells Timothy, um, sp speak to some of that. Add add to that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I I think the maybe the opposite of this would be someone who's just completely spontaneous, right? Just uh, mm. flies by the edge of the seat of their pants and just uh, makes decisions on the fly. And there's a good saying out even in the secular world that I remember that a failure to, to plan is a plan to fail, right? Mm. Um, and, and so th this is kind of a man, as you mentioned, he is thoughtful, he is intentional about what he does. Um, and so that that requires someone who's going to take time to think about, when we think about the shepherd, he's thinking about the sheep. For us, that means we're thinking about the church, we're thinking about our people, Right, so we're not always just thinking about tasks. We're we're thinking about what is the end result, which is to really shepherd and protect the flock. And it's also re responding to, uh, I think, trouble with the sheep. You know, sheep. We're called sheep for a good reason. We get ourselves into all kinds of situations, all kinds of trouble. We lose sight of God. Um, we we stop trusting. The elders him. are sheep too. So yes, absolutely, absolutely. And so we have to keep one another uh, accountable to that. And it's also how we respond to those situations. Now, just because the man is a planner, it doesn't mean that you can plan for every single possible situation. But someone who doesn't plan um, and, and thinks everything is going to go well is going to be a little bit more prone to getting upset when things don't go well. Um, where as a planner, uh, com combined with this idea of being self-controlled, um, understands that you can't plan for everything, but you plan for uh, for the majority cases. And when something happens, that falls outside of that, um, then you respond appropriately. Um, and as someone who is thoughtful and intentional, you would go to God in prayer. You would carefully consider the situation, and and determine what the what the right response is to that. Yeah, and and I mean that's a good point. And, and I think a good illustration of the opposite of that would be um, like if we took the Southern culture in in the U.S. So I grew up in the South on the East Coast, and uh, lived on the East Coast you know, a great deal of my adult life. Um, and there's a culture there. You think about the Carolinas and, and, you know, below um, Louisiana, Alabama, there's a general culture of just being very laid back. And I think the culture, the worldly part of that culture itself would be mm -hmm. antithetical to this kind of yeah. man. It, yeah. It's the kind of mindset that it makes a guy really easy to get along with and, and until things don't go his way. Uh, mm -hmm. As you mentioned, but it's just a kind of, you know, we'll just show up and whatever happens, happens. And uh, we'll we'll just, you know, it's beyond uh, letting the cares of the day be what you're concerned with. It's kind of just not worrying about it at all. Um, if things pop up, you'll kind of deal with it. But there's no real plan. There's no real thoughtfulness. Um, and and for guys who are like, well, that doesn't sound all that bad. Let, let me just bring it back to the illustration of a shepherd and a sheep. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think of um, guys who own cattle or livestock of any sort, and my grandfather was a goat farmer, um, you would not have ever found him not thinking about um, how to best tend his, his animals. Um, there, there was always, you know, does the fence need to be repaired? How much food does he have in the food barrels? Um, does he have the right mix of feed? I don't know what he fed them, but um, th those goats love that stuff. But uh, I know he mixed feed so that they would have the right balance of stuff. Um, 
And uh, I was a little kid, so I was just busy trying to wrestle the Billy Goat's horns to the ground for fun. But um, but he was constantly thinking about it. At one stage, he got um, Great Pyrenees dogs uh, for their protection because I think some wild animal got in and killed a goat or something. And so it, he was laid back in the sense that he was mild-mannered in his temperament. Mm-hmm. But he was extraordinarily thoughtful, and and he planned those things out. And I think that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. So um, I think the Southern culture does not lend itself well to um, this particular attribute, or at mm. least it it can fight against it. And so in the church, well, I mean, and you'll you'll know, right? I'm sure that in in your church and in my church, you you take time with your leaders to kind of think through like what curriculums you're doing, yeah. what Bible studies are happening. Um, I mean, we, we we choose the books that we're preaching through based on where we think the church as a whole is and and where they need to grow and develop and and what book would would best do that at the time. And so those are all very thoughtful things. And then, of course, when uh, when something pops up, you, you you know, you you can deal with it. But you're thoughtful. Um yeah, anything you want to add to that? Flesh that out a little bit. Like, what's that look like? How have you seen this kind of temperament play out in guys who you know, who you respect? Give us some examples, maybe. Well, and and I think you brought up a good example where um, elders or, or leaders are coming together. They're talking about um, spiritual direction, uh, materials to use. And it's not, it's not a decision that you rush. Um, you're not just looking for someone to give a suggestion and then run with it. You know, you want to carefully think through those suggestions um, how they fit the needs of, of the church, how they're going to be applied, and and how they fit with everything else that you're doing as a church. So it's um it's it's not just uh, being thoughtful by oneself, but it's also being thoughtful and intentional and and being slow, uh, especially when these kinds of decisions are very important. You know, I, I I say often, I've said it often on the podcast. I say it often on social media. Your theology is a lot more than just what you know. It's how you prioritize what you know. So a man who is temperate is going to take a little bit more time in making decisions that have a high impact um, upon the church. I mean, if we're debating what kind of sense to what what kind of um, aerated sense we're going to use in the bathrooms, look, just make a decision. Go, uh, you know, as long as it as long as it smells it smells pleasant. Um, but I mean, if we're talking about, for instance, uh, what kind of uh, curriculum we're going to teach uh, those within the church. What kind of curriculum we're going to give to our children? Uh, what kind of uh, maybe uh, videos or, or, or movies we might expose to our flock as as kind of a, a teaching opportunity? Those yeah. are things that need to be carefully considered. So, so, so temperate is is really just the way you go about doing that, um, knowing your priorities. Um, and so, if we don't do this, and and to your point, you mentioned this the southern kind of uh, culture, and I'm used to that with also the Thai culture in Thailand. They, they've got a saying, uh, sabai, sabai, and it, it means, oh, everything's okay, just relax, no no worries, and all that kinds of mm-hmm. stuff. And, and in all, on the one sense, it, it goes to show that, hey, you're easygoing, you're relaxed, um, but it also means, once again, you're not being very thoughtful. And you could be opening up the door wide open to all kinds of disasters happening. So when we think back to the kinds of errors that have been introduced into the church, oftentimes they're introduced by a lot of people that think that it's not really a big deal and they're taking a laid back approach and hey don't worry about it you're being too legalistic and this and that you know when when the the whole wokeness movements just started to appear just kind of the first strands of it you know a lot of the people that were discerning were sounding the alarm saying this is where it's going to lead and others were saying you're being an alarmist you're you know you're you're you know this is the slippery slope you're overreacting um just just relax uh you, you know we're this is fine and then lo and behold, in a short time, it you know the things that people were predicting absolutely happened. Um, so this is exercising care, um, recognizing what's important, working with uh, fellow leaders, partners, fellow ministers um, to figure out what's going to be best for the sheep, what's best for the church, what's going to give the most glory to God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and I think it you know for a lot of pastors, um, we we've spent time thinking about like what sources are good sources. And so, um, yeah. And and so a curriculum comes up and a lot of times you can say, okay, well we, we can instantly eliminate these groups. Like 
Um, Christianity today is trash. You should not get anything from Christianity today. Uh, right. I, I think I think one preacher who we all know and love recently referred to them as Christianity yesterday, um, yeah, which right. uh, which is really true. Um, you know, and there are other ones that you know I I wouldn't even entertain to be honest, even if they mm. had good things, because I can find those good things in other places. Because you don't want to open the door uh, for people who are still growing in discernment. Um, and so we've thought through those things already. But yeah, you ha- it, it's men who they don't just um, bring anything into the church, right? I, I think The Chosen was another great example. I, I mean, how yeah, many right. churches, I mean, like thousands upon thousands. We've seen this from pastors on social media since the beginning of that awful show, um, who have brought it into the church and, you know, talking about it and, you know, family members uh, who are excited about it and Christians. I mean, there's nowhere you can turn where you don't find Christians somewhere talking about how wonderful that show is, um, which just goes to show you how um, how much we really need uh, temperate men, men who yeah. say, OK, hold on. Um, let's make sure that this is really something worth promoting. Uh, now, for right. me, I instantly have a problem depicting the image of Christ, and so I don't mm-hmm. even personally have to go any further than that. I think it's a violation of the one of the Ten Commandments. But even beyond that, and I, I would I would give someone maybe wiggle room if they didn't see that issue. Um, but you don't have to get through but a couple episodes um, no. it, before you're like, okay, this is they're adding way too much. Um, and I think if you I, I think if you just understand the culture of theater in general, you, you would know that they have to add to scripture to make a movie. And so that should make yeah. us all uncomfortable. Right. Um, yeah. And, that's and, a and, great you know, example. I, right. And, you know, the flip side of that, um, obviously, we're we're called to uh, equip the, the, the church um, to the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. And, and we're also called to help our flock grow in discernment. Right. Um, but we're not trying to create this temp- this kind of climate where they have to check with us to determine if something can be listened to or, or to be watched. Um, yeah. But what we are talking about here is that within the church, there's a lot of different options you could choose when it comes to music, when it comes to materials, when it comes to things that you're going to expose your flock to. And, and I think we as leaders, it's not a matter of whether um, whether something... Uh, whether our flock can discern whether it's good or bad, but it's about us presenting what we think is going to be the best for the church. And look, a, a believer that watches the chosen and is able to discern the areas where things are um, okay and not okay, things that are done well and things that are not done well, and and understands that and is able to discern, I'm a lot less worried about. But when we talk about within the church, what are we going to endorse within the church? What are we going to do in terms of um, teaching the church? I, I think yeah. if you're using materials that are far from perfect, and the chosen is definitely an example of that, um, you are cheating your flock of so much better materials, specifically going to the Bible. You know, rather than going to how Hollywood may portray certain scenes, and they certainly went way outside the bounds in how they portrayed a lot of things there. Rather than going to that, why not just go to the scriptures and focus upon what the scriptures say? If we start to spend so much more time on things that the scriptures don't say, then we are implying that the scriptures are not enough. Now, there's a little bit of a rabbit trail from this topic of being temperate, but these are the kinds of things that I think leaders really need to think through when yeah. they are thinking through what they're going to expose to their flock. And recently, there was the situation with Alistair Begg, right? And Alistair mm-hmm. Begg is not a small name. I mean, he's well-known. He's got a great ministry. He's been 40-plus years preaching. He's been a great resource. And and I think everyone who ministers in the position of an elder or a pastor, um, a leader of the church, uh, probably had to spend some time thinking through how do we process what is happening with Alistair Begg and, and the advice that he gave and the way he justified it. You know, music, yeah. and I mentioned music, that's that's another area. Okay, we, we know that there are certain churches that are heretical churches— and that should be straightforward, that we don't want to support those churches, we don't want to sing their music. Okay, what about artists who may 
be at a singing concert with some of those artists, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, then you start thinking through some of those associations and and the impact of all that. You know, it has to be carefully thought through. Um, it, it can't be a decision that's uh, necessarily rushed. And, and you have to think through it from the aspect of where your church is at, um, how, yeah. how um, you know, how they're going to, how they're going to be able to receive that and whether God is ultimately glorified through all of that. So um, yeah. again, just a lot of careful thinking. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, not really too much of a rabbit trail, but because it just paints the picture. We're talking about the context of the leader in the church. And yeah. so these are things that a, a temperate man would would be thinking about and thinking through. Um, and it's just to say that if someone, um, it, you know, if someone doesn't have the propensity to think through these issues, you know, I would argue that at the very least, he's not ready to be in the eldership because this is the role. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's a difference between, um, yeah, I, I mean, you alluded to it earlier. There's a difference between um, what people choose to read and listen to um, on their own, which obviously we try to warn people and direct them yeah. to healthy uh, sources, but um, they don't have to come and ask permission. But in the church, right, it is the elder's role to make sure you are not introducing um, people to things that are heretical or things that open the door to wolves, as it were, um, or things that just aren't the best um, at your disposal. And I would argue even that um, it's the responsibility of the elders not to give the sheep um, just what's good, but what's best, which means we'll always be growing and we'll always be um, kind of looking to (laughs) refine and reform. We like that word reform. Um, you know, as we find things that were better. And Alistair Begg, yeah, that was a perfect example, I think, because any healthy leader, you know, it, it's like, it's sort of like uh, if you have children, now neither one of us have children, but every, but we understand this. If you have children and you're letting your child uh, go to a sleepover, it's not just that you're considering the other kids that might be there, but you're also considering the parents, right? Who are these parents yeah. that own this mm-hmm. house what do they believe? Um, who are they? What are they involved in? I mean, a parent is asking all these questions, not out of paranoia, but out of a right sense of um, protecting their child. And and in that sense, that's the role of an elder for a church too, right? You, you, you want to steer away from um, things that are harmful and um, and, and largely we understand that that is – you have – a you have different people in different different um areas of growth in the church by right? different levels of spiritual growth you have younger uh people in the faith in the church that will be more easily swayed by things uh, because they're still growing in right. discernment you'll have guys who have a lot more wisdom they've been walking with the lord for a long time um and they won't be swayed by those things but at the end of the day it, you don't want to feed um poison food to the congregation just because it won't kill everybody. Um, right. I don't know if that's a good illustration or not, but it seemed like one, you know. Well, you don't want to give yeah, the I, kids I, too much junk food. Right. And and I think of the um the, the the most emphasized commandment in all of Second Timothy, right? It's uh, comes in Second Timothy chapter four, where Paul says, preach the word, right? Preach the word, mm-hmm. be ready in season and out of season. And then what does he follow that up with? Reprove, rebuke exhort. Okay, now those things just by themselves, sometimes people may hear that and say, well, that's harsh, uh, you know, but but it says here, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Um, so the, the, the man who is temperate is not only thoughtful and intentional, but he's responding with great patience and instruction when these things are required, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. And I think also of First Peter chapter five, when Peter is instructing other elders, he said, "Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed." Look at this, verse two: "Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight." And he adds, "Not under compulsion, so you're not doing it um, like you're doing a, a job that you don't want to do. It's not something you do grudgingly. It's not under compulsion, yeah. but voluntarily extra, according to the will of God, 
not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So there's a conduct that's tied to all this. Not as yet, uh, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. So you're not doing this just to throw your power around, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown uh, of glory. So exercising oversight. Um, th this is what we're doing. We are exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not lording it over, um, but proving to be examples. And this is just a man that is tested, um, someone who has uh, become more and more like Christ uh, in his own um, in his own walk, and, and can now be used as an example to the rest of the flock, and, and someone who takes that position and, and recognizes the, the, the wonderful blessing, but also the mighty responsibility that comes with it. Yeah, and I think another good illustration, if thinking about a, a man being mild-mannered and, and thoughtful, um, sober-minded, would be, I mean, think about how often Paul refers to people in the church as his spiritual children. I mean, the whole Corinthian yeah. church, for instance. Yeah. Right. And so if you just think, okay, what what would a diligent parent, um, how would they be responding to in, ra in the raising of their child? I, I think that is an applicable illustration to the elders of a church. Right, you you have um, God's children, and in some sense, your own spiritual children in the church, and you should be no less diligent looking after the church for their sakes and their growth in Christ um, than a, a physical parent would be with their children. Um, and so, I, I think that's helpful. And obviously, this isn't in a condescending way; um, it, it's in a loving way. I mean, the goal ultimately um, is to see those under our care become more like Christ, um, yeah. to, to know Christ in greater measure, that they might love him in greater measure, that they might obey yeah. him in greater measure, so that they get to the end of their life and they've been faithful in what God's called them to do in the work of their ministries, um, and that they can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. All that um, you know, the elders of the church do ought to be to, to that end. Um, yeah, yeah and, I want to think... read something. Oh, yeah, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. What, 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 do you, what do you got? Oh, I'm just going to quote something from uh, Augustine of Hippo, but go ahead first. Yeah, I'm looking at um, Acts chapter 20 now when Paul um, visits the, he has the elders at the church of Ephesus come to see him, and he's going to see them for the last time. But he says this in Acts chapter 20, starting from verse 27, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, the whole purpose of God. In verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. So there is a vigilance. You mentioned that word earlier in verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And, and look at this, verse 31. Therefore, be on the alert, again, that vigilance, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. Now, in this case, when we think of someone who's temperate and self-controlled, he we see here in verse 31, Paul is that time been broken down into tears trying to admonish them with the truth. And, and I'll tell you what, if there is any kind of emotion um, that that is going to demonstrate the love of Christ to people. It's going to be the emotion that comes from your love for them, right? Uh, your your concern for them. It's not someone who's going to be angry, who's trying to throw around power, who's um, getting frustrated because the the sheep just doesn't do what he says. But it's someone who is willing to have the heart of Paul, where for a period of three years he did not cease to admonish each one, even with tears. Yeah. No, that's good. And I think this is a good place just to remind guys, which we'll, I'm sure, do with every one of these um, characteristics, is that, that no one does, no one lives in these things in a state of perfection, right? right. No one can be perfectly um, prudent. No one can be perfectly temperate. Um, but the overall character and and even one who's seeking to grow in these things, right? And And the elders grow spiritually the same way everyone else does being in the word being in prayer yep. um and, and i think this is uh let, let me read this from augustine to hippo because i think it's a it's a great 
uh, quote that lends itself to um, not not only the elder needing to have this characteristic, but why he needs to have it in terms of being an example for others. Um, so he says, the man then who is temperate in such mortal and transient things has his rule of life confirmed by both testaments, that he should love none of these things, nor think them desirable for their own sakes, but should use them as far as, as is required for the purposes and duties of life with the moderation of an employer instead of the ardor of a lover. Um, and so he's talking about just loving the things of the world, basically. Um, and, and so I know sometimes guys will look at pastors and say, oh, well, you're you're just a pietist. <laughs> um, yep, you've never yep. been accused of that, have you, Eki? Um, no, of course not. Uh, and it, but really, but but in reality, uh, I can speak. Piety is godliness right yeah, now. Pietism yeah. is something different. We won't get right. into that here, but. Um, you do want to be pious. You want to be holy. And, you know, the the elder is meant to be a man who demonstrates in his life that he has little concerns and love for the things of this world. Um, it doesn't mean that he doesn't enjoy um, the things of this world. I mean, God's given us lots of common graces. I mean, no. coffee and bacon, two common <laughs> graces to mankind. Enjoy them. Um, pizza. <laughs> pizza. Hey, amen. Um, yeah, there there are other things. Recreation, uh, you know, different yeah. forms of recreation that are healthy and good. But I think um, you'll find a man who is thoughtful in all of those areas too, and that would be covered in this temper. And so you'll find a man who is, um, I, I think, maybe a little more cautious as to what he fills his mind with, um, what movies he's watching. And and I think this is an area where oftentimes, you know, guys generally in the church can look at elders and say, "Oh, well, you know, you're 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 just pious, um, you know, you're you're too you know you're you're too holy, yeah. um, you're holier than thou kind of thing." No, um, it, it's a man who understands that you cannot get out of your mind the things you put into it, um, and that filling your mind with things that aren't the best. Sometimes they're just actually bad, um, yeah. but even at times things that just aren't the best, it's not worth the battles that you may fight because of that later on. So right. you're watching – I'll give, give you a good <laughs> example. You're watching a movie. There's been tons of these throughout the years that we've fought against. Um, groups of people in the church would leave church Sunday and then go watch this movie that was riddled with all kinds of filth. Um, maybe it was pornographic stuff. There's been several movies that were popular for that. And I would hear Christians say things, oh, we just skip past those parts. I, I mean, really? Well, it, it, you have to get to the part to be yeah. able to skip it, <laughs> which means you're going to see something that's no. going to cause your imagination to go places it shouldn't. And so I, I think a temperate man would say, you know what? I want to stay away from that temptation. I'm just not even going to watch that. It's not worth it. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think would would lend itself to this kind of man. And again, it doesn't mean he doesn't enjoy movies. It doesn't mean he doesn't enjoy good books, you know, or golfing if you like that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but it just means that he's thinking about, you know what, what what's going to benefit my spiritual walk and what's going to hinder my spiritual walk. And I want to be an example of someone who lives my life in such a way that people can imitate me as I imitate Christ. Yeah, our time is limited. Uh, we have to re re realize that um, it's a it's a forever shrinking resource until the Lord ultimately calls us into His presence. So, how you spend your time um, matters, and you want to spend your time in the best possible way. And to your point. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your time. In fact, we know from the Bible God has given all given us all things to enjoy, but we don't make that into the idol, and, and we don't get reckless uh, with those kinds of decisions. Um, so there's a saying in the computer world, garbage in, garbage out. Um, what you put into your mind, what you put into your heart is going to what's going to come out of your mind and come out of your mm -hmm. heart. So why not put in things that are, are not going to pollute it? You know, when it comes to entertainment, I get it. We're, we're not always going to be watching entertainment that's going to be feeding us the, the Word of God. Um, but engage in something that's not going to feed your mind and your heart with with sinful thoughts and, and lusts yeah. and, and lead to idolatries. 
Yeah, and I think just as a reminder, these are all characteristics that are just Christian characteristics. Right. Um, the, the reason they are set here um, out for the elders is because the leaders of the church are meant to be examples of Christian virtue. Um, and, and so they should already have obtained the, the the general character of these things. And so every believer should look at this list and say, this is what, what God wants from me. Um, every believer, right? Um, with the only exception, which we'll get to it eventually, is is the, the one that is a qualification of being able to teach. But all right. of these character things um, – and you make a really good point uh, uh, about movies. Um, it, we don't have to I, – I, I don't think we have to um, – you know, always fill our mind with movies that have Bible verses. And I mean, let's just be honest. Most movies that try to imitate anything yeah, biblical are yeah. awful and they twist scripture and it's just better to stay away from them. Generally speaking, there might be yeah, some exceptions out there. Christian. Yeah. Christian movies um, are uh, an extremely mixed bag and, and I don't find a, a lot of them to, to be all that good. Now documentaries that, that may be a different story. So, I mean, Things like um, American Gospel um, that that talk about yep. that talk about some and addresses what the true gospel is, and you hear from a lot of good and faithful men of the church. Though even in the, some of those documentaries, depending upon when it was filmed, you may be also be exposed to people that have gone astray since then, right? So you still have to be discerning. But I do find overall that um, Christian documentaries um, are far more helpful and far more edifying than Christian movies, where you're really kind of at the mercy of the ones who put that movies that movie together. Mm -hmm. And and what that person's worldview and their their view of scripture and what their view of what's most important to put before you, and then also I mean I've you know I think of Priscilla Schreier that's this is the daughter of Tony Evans, and her name has been popping up more and more. She recently preached, um, or at least I saw a video of her preaching at Joel Osteen's church, where she's talking uh, unbiblical nonsense about if you're going through trials, there's a drawer that God is going to open for you and. And that kind of stuff. She has shown up in some of these Christian movies as well. So that's the other. Um, mm. That's the other reason why sometimes I cringe at these Christian movies. You know, what individuals are you going to be exposed to? And th those individuals, knowing that they are that they are extremely public people, right? I mean, these aren't small name actors that you have no idea what they're doing. But these yeah. are extremely public p people. What's going to be the temptation? With regards to following that person, or um, or or em emulating their lifestyle, or, or even coveting some of the things that they have in their own lives. Yeah, I'd rather just go watch Braveheart. It's way better. <laughs> yeah, Gladiator. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so so there are those 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 movies that they they have nothing to do with scripture, uh, but you want to stay away from things that you know are going to tempt you to sin. Right. That's basically the thing. And so just to kind of bring this back to the elder. So, it, you know, if you're an elder board or search committee or, or a church that's, you know, looking together to find a pastor. I mean, what you're looking for is not a perfect man. You're not going to find a perfect man. Every every man in the pulpit is going to sin. He's going to disappoint his congregation. He's going to sin against his congregation. He's going to have to repent for those things. And uh, not all sins are disqualifiers. I mean, we all sin. Right. Um, I just mean in the sense of just being human, right? Um, but but you're looking for a man who is a thoughtful, um, calculating, sober-minded, mild-mannered man, um, yeah. or or someone who is growing in that area to the extent that you could say that this this characterizes this guy, you know. Um, and then and and that's what you're looking for, and for yourselves, you know, men and women. I mean, this is this is the character of Christ, um, mild mannered, calculating, discerning, thoughtful. I mean, Christ didn't do anything haphazardly. Obviously, mm -hmm. God does nothing right. haphazardly. And if we're to be imitators of Christ right. um, and His character, then all of us should be seeking um, to be this. And I think one one way uh, one way that we could say this is also that um, we we live a life that isn't controlled by our emotions. Right. right. Um, you know, so whether we're upset and there's times to be upset or whether we're sad or whether we're happy that we don't indulge overindulge in those emotions such that they lead us to do things that are, you know, counter to uh, to biblical principles. And so mild mannered in, in that way, too. Any last thoughts for us? No, I think this has been a pretty thorough treatment um, of the word. And to your point, and I just want to reiterate 
these are characteristics that all Christians should strive for. And, and we'll get to the part about able to teach. That's, you know, that's more of a gifting. And so we realize not everyone's going to fall into that category. But the reason why these are the kinds of men that you want to elevate to the status, uh, to the position and the responsibility of, of elder is because they have shown themselves to be Christ-like in their walk. And these are the characteristics characteristics that simply describe one who has shown himself to be Christ-like. And so to that point, even if you're not seeking to be an elder, or maybe you're a woman listening to this, these characteristics still hold. Um, we are seeking to be Christ-like in our attitude, in our opinion, in our in our thoughts, in our, in our actions, the way we think through things, the way we respond to things, uh, the decisions that we make in our life, the discernment that we show. All of this are things that we should be striving for, even if we are not necessarily going to be in that position of an elder. Yeah, amen. And pray for your elders that yeah. God would grow them in these areas. Um, so, well, with that, guys, we thank you for listening. Hope this has been helpful. I, I really was like, how are we going to get more than 15 minutes of content yeah. on this one? Um, you say that I at do the start hope, of every one. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's true. You know. Um, I do hope it's been, uh, hope it's been helpful for you. Don't forget we have a YouTube channel, uh, go there, subscribe. We're trying to get to 50, uh, 500 subscribers. I think we have like 250 or something to 80. Oh. I don't know. Um, but we appreciate you guys listening to us. We do it for our churches primarily. Um, and then for anyone else out there listening to just encourage you in your faith to equip you so that you know the scriptures in a candid and unapologetic way. Um, and, uh, our emails in the show notes, if you want to shoot us an email with some recommendations, if you would like, uh, specific topics to be covered, listen, we, we want to scratch where there's an itch as it was, as it were. Um, and so, uh, we know there's a ton of topics out there. The world's going crazy and people have questions. We want to get them answered for you. So send us an email. We appreciate you guys. And until next time, let the truth be known. The truth be known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.